Acts chapter 20 and verse 16. If you got it, would you stand and honor the reading of the word as is our custom? Hallelujah. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not he would not spend the time in Asia for he hastened if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for Pentecost. We thank you for this church, this great assembly of people here to worship your name. I ask you to move this morning, multiply, help, help each and every one answer prayers in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you ever had anybody ask you what Pentecost was? Have you ever wondered what Pentecost was? Well, what is Pentecost? I mean, you know, we got that scripture in the day of Pentecost has fully come. Brother Carrington pastors the Pentecostal Church, First United Pentecostal Church of, of, of Farmington. Um, but, but that's just a name over a door, just like we're apostolic. It means the same thing. We're, we've, it just, it's the same. But what is Pentecost? There's a power in what Pentecost is. And I, I, I feel free this morning to take notes. I'm just going to teach a little bit and, uh, and, and, and then you'll tell them what you might, you might get out of this. But uh, you should, by the time this lesson's over with, just find some power in what Pentecost is all about. Amen? Paul had determined to be at Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. So there is a holiday we call Pentecost. In the old Hebrew, when you try to pronounce a Hebrew word, it's uh, Shabbat. In the Bible, it's Shabbat is translated into the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. The reason why it's called the Feast of Weeks is there is a counting that is done. From the time of uh, a set point of Passover, you count 50 days... And that is Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, or Shabbat. Call it whatever you want. That's as deep as it's going to get with all the foreign languages this morning. So for the rest of you that want it in Spanish or uh, Navajo, I have no clue. That's just as good as it gets. The Bible tells us that we are to count the days. We are to start counting from the second day after Passover. In other words, in modern day lingo, from Easter on. We count until 50 days, and it is Pentecost. Seven weeks after Easter is Pentecost Sunday. And it is a powerful revelation of what Pentecost is. It was important to the Jews to count this time. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people call it the counting of the Omer. I don't know what Omer has to do with it, but Omer probably was somebody's uncle and you count your uncles or whatever, I don't know. But it was 50 days after Passover. They counted that. There is a calendar that is actually produced each and every year still today that is designed to allow and to help the, the, the Jewish people count the days till Pentecost. It was important. It is a reason, it a type and a shadow that God wanted them to have deep inside of their mind to recognize, to look at, to always have it before them and to every year celebrate this holiday. There was three holidays in the Word of God. The first holiday was the Feast of Weeks. This was the time of the first fruits. This was the time of the beginning of the crop. What began to deal with this on me back at home the other day is they were bringing in the first of the crops of the winter wheat. And I saw the fields of the winter wheat just stretched out. It looked like, you know, from the air, it looked like a bunch of dirt, like which y'all get used to here. And there was a big old patch of corn that's green, and there was a big old patch of brown, and that's the winter wheat. And, and, and from the air, it looks like just dirt fields. But down on the ground, you got this stand of wheat, and they were bringing that in. They were starting to harvest that before the storms came. And so that is what Pentecost is a representation of, of the first fruits. And so the children of Israel were to mark that this first fruit following 
the, 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 the Passover was the first fruits, and they were to come to Jerusalem at Passover. That's the first holiday of the year, was to come for Passover. That was the Feast of Tabernacles. And they were to bring their sacrifice. They were to celebrate Passover as a body of people, offer sacrifices before God for their sins, for atonement, and etc., etc., etc. And then they were to come back seven weeks later, and where they were to bring the first fruits of their crops, and they were to rejoice and celebrate the Feast of Weeks. And there was another feast that they came at the end of the year that was the harvest time for the rest of the crops. And they came at the end of the year to again to gather to celebrate the blessings of God. Now I would mentioned to the church this on uh, Friday night at healing service. Something about this I had never heard in my mind, in my, in my teaching all my years. I've never heard anybody mention it. I've read the Bible a whole bunch of times. But Sister Dalton, I had not even read this. Well, I've read it, but I didn't. Anybody ever read stuff you just didn't pay attention to it? Kind of like school. Y'all you know what I'm talking about? Okay. But it said that not to worry about it. To pack up all, just, just pack your family up. Pack everybody in town up. Every stranger, every servant, every child, every, every woman, every child, everybody in the, in the whole community. And go to Jerusalem for these three feasts, which included Pentecost, which is what we're talking about this morning. Now, y'all... I, I know a little bit about abandoning cities because, you know, they, li they left the city of New Orleans down there and they, everybody took off and left and a whole bunch of people came in and started stealing stuff. When you walk away from it, just think, if you all packed up tomorrow afternoon and, and, and everybody decided we're just going to pack up Farmington and go to Shiprock for the fair. How long before the folks from Aztec, you know those guys, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Are they going to come get you a color TV? Are they going to live in your house while you're gone? All that kind of... God said that no one would have any desire for your land. The tribe of Dan and all their people, 100 and something miles, 200 miles or so from, from Jerusalem. Y'all just leave town. Don't worry about it. Everything will be just fine. Y'all just go on. God says, I've got everything covered. If you'll come and celebrate worship with me, I've got everything covered back home. Now, I, I don't know, but that's pretty cool stuff right there. Because there was Canaanites, there was Jebusites, there was Philistines, there was other ites, Amorites and Amalekites and uh, a bunch of other ites. And, and God said, don't worry, they're, they're, not, they're going to just forget all about you while you're in Jerusalem. Several days journey, seven days while you're there celebrating, several days go back home, don't worry about it, everything's all right. Boy, I, God, you know what, if you just take care of God's business... God take care of your business, amen? Let me get on with it, okay? Hallelujah. Let's look at it. The Feast of Weeks, Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse number 10. And thou shalt keep the Feast of Weeks, or Shabbat, or Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek translation of this, by the way. Unto the Lord thy God, with a tribute of a freewill offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God has blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice... Before the Lord thy God. Everybody say rejoice. Y'all sit and say that like you were happy with it. Try it again. Rejoice. rejoice. You are to rejoice before the Lord your God. Amen. Thou and thy son. God wants your kids to rejoice too. That's why I tell our parents when you come for prayer meeting, bring your kids. When you come to church, bring your kids. Brother, you understand, I, I, I just feel bad. My kids just run all over the place. Don't worry about it. It's just fine. But when they're here, they're hearing the Word. If they're not here, what, well, are going to wait to hear the Word when they're 18 years old and they've already been, the, the devil hears, teaches them every day on the TV and everything else. Let them hear the Word. I don't care if they're three years old running up and down here. They come grab my leg. That's fine. It'll be all right. The only thing I ask is don't go up on the platform. That's, that's the holy ground. We just, we just honor that. Beside that, everything's okay. And I'm going to get back to it. And rejoice! Thou shalt rejoice the Lord thy God and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt 
and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Every year you are to observe the feast. This is Jewish type and shadow. We need to understand what they're talking about so we can understand where we're at. God wanted us to have an uh, have an example. So every year they were to go and observe the feast at Jerusalem. Now, there were some things that was involved that brought them to this point. There was a beginning of the Feast of Weeks. And that's what we're going to get into today. Children of Israel are in Egypt. They're in bondage. Egypt is a type of sin. Egypt is a type of the world. We're all born in sin, shape and iniquity. We are not, we are not born saints of God. You might be, oh, I praise the Lord. I'm third generation Pentecost. My grandfather was a preacher and my other grandfather and, and his greedy, greedy grandmammy preached and came over on a Mayflower carrying a Bible. That doesn't do you one hunky bit of good. You got to get it for yourself. Bible's very clear on that. You got, I got to get it for me and you got to get it for you. So, but we realize that we were born in sin. And Egypt is a type and a shadow of, it, it is an example, a, 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 what do you call a metaphor, whatever, of sin, of the sinful life, of the things of the world. And so there is the children of Israel 400 years in bondage. Do you realize that you are a slave to sin? Whenever sin rules over you, when you do sin, you are a slave to sin, and it is your master, and it will rule over you. But Jesus said to, Abra to Moses, He said, Moses, I want you to go down and speak unto the children of Israel. Now, there's a lot of people that are confused about this. That's just simply because they hadn't paid attention to their Bible. He did not tell him to tell Pharaoh this. He said, speak unto the children of Israel. I am that I am. What's the difference between children of Israel and Pharaoh? Pharaoh was a scum dog, was lost, and wasn't going to come out. He did not need to believe in God. He did not need to believe in deliverance because he did not, wasn't going to listen to it anyway. All he had was what was about me and build my pyramids and build this and do that and, and I'm going to beat you if you don't like it and, if, and, and go get me some, a cup of wine and I'm going to sit here and, and everybody else run around and do my stuff. He wasn't seeking God. But the children of Israel for 400 years had been seeking deliverance. And the Bible says their cry had come unto God. And God heard their cry and remembered His covenant with Abraham. And sent Moses said, you go tell them that I exist. When you read the, study the word, I am that I am, the definition is I exist. I've heard by the ear that there was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Abraham was the friend of God, but we have not seen God because we were on the backside of, of sin and lost, and we were not doing what was pleasing to God. But now I want to know, is there a God? God says, go tell my people that I exist. Go tell the children of Israel that I am that I am. The first step of the children of Israel is they had to believe in God. The first step to Pentecost is to believe in God. Do you believe? Yes. Do you believe like the Bible says? Jesus says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that absent-mindedly find Him. No, that diligently seek Him. He's a rewarder of the... So you must believe. Number one, children of Israel had to believe that there was a God before God could deliver them. They had to believe that there was a God. Let me tell you something, children of, a of Jacob, all you children of Israel, there is a God. He's real. I met Him in the wilderness. He showed in a, ferny, in a burning bush and He said, take off your shoes for the place that you stand is holy ground. Cast down your rod. It's going to turn into a serpent. Stick your hand into your vest and pull it out. It's full of leprosy. Put it back in. It's going to come out clean. All these things. He said, you go show those signs to the children of Israel that they might believe that the God of Abraham is alive and well and hears their prayers. Church family, why do we have healing service around here? Because the world needs to believe that God is alive and hears their prayers. Jesus came walking on the ground. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. If, I, if it were not true, I would have told you. Why did He do the miracles that He did? He said, I, you've seen the signs, you've seen the wonders, yet you still don't believe. Jesus was trying to get them to believe. First step of Pentecost is to believe. 
We're going to have Pentecost celebration here next week. We need to build up our faith in God. We need to build up our faith in His truth. We need to walk with God, trust God, and believe in God. The second thing that happened to get to Pentecost was a covering of the blood. For Passover came and the, the Bible says He was going to send the angel of death throughout the, all of the country of Egypt, all of the land round about. I don't know how far it went. It may have went all the way to South America. I have no idea. But the Bible says He was sending the death angel on that night. Could you imagine poor Chinese dude wake up that morning? Oh, <gasps> His kid did and didn't know why. I have no idea. It may, it, the Bible does not tell you the borders that the death angel was going to go. Doesn't say. But it went. But that is the wages of sin. Romans tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What was the gift of God? God said you could take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doorpost and across the lintel. And when the angel passed by and he saw the blood, he would pass over that house. In other words, brother, in your house, because of sin, the Spirit of God demanded the life of your firstborn. But the gift of God was to give that life back to you. So the application of the blood saved the life of the firstborn of all of the children of Israel when they put it upon the wall. Whenever they sacrificed the lamb as an atonement for their sin. For a house there was a lamb. For every home a lamb was there. And the blood of atonement was there. You see, whenever that death angel came by, every dog in the house, the firstborn of the litter, was taken. Every cow in the barn, the firstborn of the cow was taken. Every cattle, every beast. Man, if you had a parakeet and it had a little laid an egg, I don't know which egg was first, but God knew which egg was first. And God took the firstborn of every last one of them. I'm going to tell you something. What a horrible feeling that had to be the next day. I, I tell you, I just, that would be horrible. But this is the path to Pentecost. This is the path to Pentecost. It was through the blood. It was through faith. We believe in God. We receive the atonement for our sins and the covering that the death angel passes us by. And then came the Red Sea. The Bible says that the children of Israel passed through the sea. They passed through the place. No wonder why stuff ain't working up there. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sorry about that. One of these days we'll have that electrician come in here and finish wiring this place like it's supposed to be. I scratched my head all over the place trying to figure out why on earth that wasn't working. Amen. Sorry about that. I said, you never know what comes up during the middle of preaching. Just got to take care of it and go on. But the Bible says, let me, let me, let me go to Hebrews here. Get my glasses off so I can read it. Oh. I'm sorry, see, it's 1 Corinthians. That's why I take my glasses off so I can read. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant, ignorant for you city folks, how that our fathers were under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We know that they came out. We know that they stood at the edge of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter number uh, 14. tells us all about it. They're standing there and hold the rod over the Red Sea and it parted hither and hither. And this is a type and a shadow of the cleansing of the walking through of the water. You see, that water should have drowned them, but Jesus Christ brought them out. So they were all baptized. The type and a shadow of baptism was them coming through. Before they could get to Pentecost, they had to get baptized in the flood, in the water, in the cloud. That was the type and the shadow of baptism. And so the children of Israel coming out of sin, <coughs> believing in God, the application of the blood, baptism, and now they're on the other side of the Red Sea. And they're on their way to Pentecost. 
Church, this is, this is something whenever God gripped my heart with this thing about uh, a week ago about this Pentecost business and about how powerful it is. You know, th this was a time of joy. This is a time of rejoicing. This was a time of exuberance and excitement. Why? Because sin was in the world and sin was overcoming and overshadowing and destroying. But it took several days. It took seven weeks from the time of the atonement of the blood to go through the Red Sea to come all the way to Mount Sinai. Anybody know what happened at Mount Sinai? Well, I'll tell you. They got to Mount Sinai and they found a roller coaster in the mountain. And a Mickey Mouse. No. That's Space Mountain. They got to Mount Sinai and God settled down on the mountain. And the mountain shook and the smoke and the, and, the, and the flames as God came there. And all the people could hear His voice and they were afraid. And the Bible says that Moses went up into the mount of God. And God gave him the commandments and the law. You see, it took 50 days, it was 7 weeks from the time of the atonement of the blood to the receiving of the law. Well, praise the Lord, Brother Dunn, we're not under the law, we're under grace. You're right! Ain't that wonderful? But it's only wonderful if you recognize how powerful the law is. Amen. Amen. You know, I was... <coughs> I've said it here a thousand times, maybe, maybe two. David said, I delight in the law. And his law do I meditate day and night. Why? Because it is a law. It is consistent. How many of y'all know what two plus two is? <laughs> Let's try that again. One plus one is... Why? I, I, I just I pick y'all sitting on the same row. I'm gonna pick on you. Is that what taught you in school? Huh? What, what grade are you in? Seventh. seventh. You probably learned that what second grade? Okay. So you're in seventh grade. This is 2014. So that was like 2000 and like eight, right? Sounds good. What year did you go to school? <laughs> Help me out. Second grade was what year? Ballpark. Guess. 1960. Was that what they taught you back in? 1960, 2008. Why did they teach the same thing? I mean, science, they teach all kind of new stuff all the time because the scientists find out new things and we catch teach new things. They teach new history because they revise history because they don't want people to know what it was and we change it to fit our popular culture or whatever. But math is a law. 1 plus 1 in 1960 equals the same thing as it does in 2008. The law of God works just like that. If you do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to do this. If you do X, Y, and Z, if you will obey the Lord, I'm going to bless you. That's the law. If you despise God, I'm going to curse you. That's the law. It works so well that you could just get up in the morning. David said, this is a joy. The law of the Lord is a joy unto me. Why? Because I found out how to please God. And there's a result of pleasing God. It's consistent. It's, it, we're not talking about the, 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 the little tassels on the bottom of your garment and letting your hair grow, curls grow on your sideburns. We're not talking about the, the cultural law. We're talking about the law of God. And it's still real. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law of God in the body of Christ. He was the He fulfilled the law. So when we are in Him, we are in the law. Uh, we look to Him as an answer of all that. If I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, He's going to be with me and never leave me or never deny me. He's never going to forsake me. Why? Because that's the law. And I can look to the cross and I can look to Jesus. And the law says there has to be a blood atonement. Oh, I don't have to go kill no goat. Jesus Christ died for me. He shed blood for me. He fulfilled the law, but yet the law is still right. That blood must be atonement for my sin. The law is still true. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. 
So in the law, Jesus has fulfilled all the law. And they got the law, and this is Pentecost. This is the celebration. This is the joy. We don't understand it in our nation right now because we got more laws than we got people. I mean, they say the tax law is like, what, 30-something thousand pages. Could you imagine carrying that book in your hip pocket? <laughs> The, 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 the new welfare, health, health care reform thing, Majigger, is what, 2,800 pages or something like that? It, it's massive. But imagine if we all lived in a yellow submarine with no laws. I mean, you think no laws is good. Let, let me, I'm going to pick up my young people here, okay? Y'all help me out. You ready? How many of y'all have curfew at home? Okay, got two. The rest of y'all just have nowhere to go. <laughs> How would you like it if, I mean, I know your parents don't do this, but like every couple days it changed. You get it? I mean, y'all don't like curfew, do you? No. Okay, but how about if you come home tomorrow at curfew time, what time is your curfew? Eight. What time is your curfew? Nine. Nine. Okay. You come home at eight o'clock, your curfew time. And mom goes, why weren't you here at 6 o'clock? That's curfew. Next day you come home, oh, well, you're home early, it's not even 10 o'clock yet. <laughs> Next day you come home, you should be here at 5 o'clock. You're grounded for a week. <laughs> now you don't like curfew, but don't you like curfew? Don't you like the law? You might want to stay out a little later, whatever, but you know what you can do. It doesn't change from day to day. That's what the law is. Everybody served God according to as it was pleasing in his own mind in those days, and nothing was consistent. You know, people want to serve God according to their own thoughts and their own process and their own ways, and they can't get a consistent outcome from it. Hereby, the law comes in, and the people receive the law and they have a respect for the law and now we know how to live and we now have peace in that and we now have God's presence and we now have pleased God but not just that they also got the civil code how to live with people I mean if, if you had to live next door to Sister Savannah it might just not work out too well if you didn't have some basic laws in our community that says she's not allowed to throw her candy wrappers over your fence it's a good thing to have laws. It creates civilization. The Bible says that from... Uh, uh, scripture. Romans. There we go. Romans. Chapter number 5, verse 13. For until the law was in the, in the world... Hang on. My, my reader... But until the law was, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. What's that saying? When I got to Pentecost, I got life. Amen. When I got to Pentecost, I got life. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I got faith in God. That didn't give me life. I got the blood. That didn't give me life. I got baptized. That didn't give me life. But when I got born again, I got Life. Amen. Sorry, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. Romans chapter 6. How, uh, but that being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your... You ha you have your fruit unto holiness. If I could read, I could preach a whole lot better. You have your fruit unto holiness. 
the end to the end of everlasting life, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's look at a thing. So we've looked at the Old Testament. Where did the Feast of Pentecost come from? The Feast of Weeks. It came from the children of Israel having a beginning a relationship with God, coming through, believing in Him, pass over the atonement of blood, baptism, 50 days later, they get the law. They get life. They get a way out. They get civilization. They get salvation. They get all of that. Now let's look at what happens here. And, and the, there's a man by the name of Joel. I know Joel played that saxophone pretty good this morning. And I'm proud of my boy. Let me brag on him. He just got a huge scholarship to University of Tennessee. And it's, although I'd rather see him go to another college because I'm not a UT fan, I'm just glad he's going to college. Okay, now my scripture. There was a man in the Bible by the name of Joel, chapter 2 and verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon thy servants and upon thy handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, of blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for the Mount of Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant of the Lord and, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Joel prophesied of an outpouring of the Spirit of God. This is in the Old Testament. Book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. Children of Israel were in bondage. And there's a prophet who begins to prophesy. And he says, there shall come a time when he is going to pour out of his Spirit upon all flesh. It doesn't matter what your flesh is. It doesn't matter if you're, if, if you're a Cuban. If it doesn't matter if you're a Mexican. It doesn't matter if you're, a, if you're an Anglo-Saxon. It doesn't matter if you're Chinese. Your flesh, God made all flesh. He says, I'm going to pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. I'm going to tell you what. That's a day that ought to be looking toward. When everything has gone bad. And Israel has gone bad and turned their back on God. And all things are crushed. But all of a sudden, an old man of God steps out and begins to speak of a power and a promise from God coming down from heaven upon all flesh. I'm going to tell you what, that's Babylonian flesh. That's Egyptian flesh. That's Arabian flesh. That's Muslim, not Muslim flesh, but that's a, whatever, Arab flesh. And, and, and that's, that's Jewish flesh. That, that's everybody. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, what a great thing that is. That, that promise that there is, come, is to come. Watch this. Jesus comes out there and he's talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus. John chapter 3 and verse 3. And Jesus answered him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, it's a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And I can't see my paper. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, This ain't Bartholomew. This ain't Bubba. This ain't Bill Clinton. You can believe this. This ain't a lot of things. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I... When you read the word verily, verily in the Bible, it's like saying, Hey, 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 hey. So Jesus said, Hey, hey, Nicodemus, hey. Shut up a sec. I'm trying to talk. I verily I say unto ye, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. You keep reading that same conversation. Same conversation. Somebody quote for me John 3.16. 
Louder. Okay. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, what? Believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What was the first step to get to Pentecost? He's standing there talking to Nicodemus. He said, you're a ruler of Jerusalem. You're a ruler of the Jews, and you don't understand these things. You need to believe, Jack. Or Nicodemus. You need to believe, Nicodemus. First step, you're going to be saved, you've got to believe. Children of Israel, you're going to get to Pentecost, you've got to believe. Jesus got a whole bunch of people believing. He raised, he started doing miracles, signs, and wonders. He raised, oh, 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 what's his face from the grave? And the Bible says many of the Jews believed and went to this town, and many believed, and they believed in Samaria, and they believed. They came out and heard him preach and teach, and they believed. Brought the woman to him, and they got caught in adultery, and they went away believing. He said, go and sin no more. Went in the house with all the lawyers, and he healed their stupid thinking, and they went away believing. What was he doing? He was getting them to believe. Three and a half years, all he was doing was, you need to believe on me. You need to believe on me. You need to believe on me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that cometh to me, God must believe that I am. You've got to come through me. Believe, 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 believe. Do you believe? Amen. Bible says the children of Israel were cut off because of their unbelief. But if we want to be grafted in, we've got to believe. If we're going to get to Pentecost, we've got to believe. That's good. Jesus said you must be born again. Jesus then goes on to live his life and he dies on Calvary. I like this. This is exciting. You see, it, the world is full of sin. And we need atonement for sin. And Jesus goes up Calvary's hill. And we talked about this this Easter service uh, uh, recently of Jesus being crucified on the cross. And I could spend hours with you teaching you of the, of the type and the shadow of all the Old Testament sacrifice and how Jesus fulfilled that for us. Aren't you glad you didn't have to bring a goat to church with you this morning? Amen. I am too, because that means I'd have to cut its throat, drain the blood, cut out its innards, throw it on a grill, cook it for you, give it back to you. I mean, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Luke 23. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, He gave up the ghost. In other words, He died. He croaked. He's gone. <coughs> he was not lost. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I have a hard time because I think everything is funny. And, we, and then please don't, please don't be offended. But when y'all say prayer requests, you know, my next door neighbor lost their aunt last week. Well, send out a search party. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, please help them find her. Jesus was not lost. He was dead. He died. We didn't lose him. The flesh just died. That's the difference between us and him. He gave up the ghost. He said, it's my life. I can lay it down. I'll pick it back up again. Watch this. I like this scripture in Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many of the bodies of the saints which were which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Well, let me tell you what happened. There's something going on in the graveyard. Because the final blood, you see all of the ox and all of the bullocks and all of the, the goats and all of the sheep and all the turtle doves and all the fine flowered mingle, or all the fine flour mingled with oil could not set men free. All it could do was lay up as a type and a shadow from all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Noah, all the way back to Adam and Eve. They sacrificed lambs, they sacrificed goats, they sacrificed for the blood because it simply rolled it ahead and put it to their account. 
but there was one lamb and his name was Jesus and he went upon Calvary and he died for our sins and his blood was perfect. It was exactly what was needed and all of a sudden whenever that drop of blood hit the earth it cracked open every grave it made judgment for everyone that died in Christ. Everyone died in the hope of glory. All of a sudden redemption was there. The penalty for sin was paid and life came back to them and they arose to be with him. Sorry, that's a little bit more exciting to me than it is you. You know what they were doing? Sister Savannah, I want you to learn this song. I got it for you. I'm gonna, I'll give it to you. You don't have it yet. You do have a different version, but I just kind of cut off all the yakking. Until that day, I'm going to keep on singing. Looking forward to that day. I can't sing. I wish I could sing. Until that day, I'm going to keep on rejoicing. What day is that? The day when I, my Savior calls me home. I'm going to keep on serving Him. I'm going to keep on living for Him. Oh, what did they do? I imagine all them saints in the grave laying there said, Until that day. Oh, 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 what's his, what's his name? In, uh, uh, Lazarus? He's laying there. Until that day. When I hear His voice calling me, I'm just going to just... Lazarus! When His days... Right in this story. Get up here. Amen. <laughs> Robert, come on out. Come on. <coughs> You're going to hear that. <coughs> biddy, biddy, biddy. You're going to have that thing stuck up your nose and um, who knows what else. You're going to have at the hospital there. All. <laughs> and all them grandkids be around you. <laughs> Next thing you know, Brother Pastor Clyde, come here, boy. Your turn. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. I said, you're going to get called up yonder, church. You're not going to stay in this old pit. You're not going to stay in the grave. We're going up yonder. But the children of Israel and we walk through this world with the wages and the weight of sin upon our shoulders. Heading to Pentecost. We believe. Jesus died for us. He said, you must be baptized. You need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the washing away. You can be hey, Nicodemus, if you'll believe, you'll be born again of water and of spirit. I'll take care of the blood. You be born again of water and of spirit. What's that mean? You need to be come through the blood. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name. The old man needs to be buried. And that man gets buried and washed away all of his sins. It's all gone. He comes up as a fresh new creature in Christ Jesus. And he's looking to Pentecost. He's heading to Pentecost. You see, the, the, the apostles were standing out there on the hill. Mount of Olives. And Jesus staying there talking to him. I want to, I'm going to read you what Jesus said to him. I like uh, Jesus, Jesus. Where are you at, Jesus? Where is Jesus, 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 Jesus? If you have to seek for Jesus this long, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. That ain't it. Acts chapter... I know where it's at. I'm just trying to read it. Where's my Acts chapter 1? Did you erase my paper? You mischievous child. No. Acts chapter 1 and verse 48. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, that if y'all would kind of like to do this, y'all should. No, he commanded them that they should not depart Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, uh, no, the times or the seasons which the Father 
hath put in his own power, hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come on you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, go tarry in the upper room in Jerusalem until you have the what I've got for you. I've told you all about it. I promised it to you. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. So they did. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now let's back up. Fifty days before Pentecost was what? Passover, the crucifixion of Christ is 50 days before Pentecost. The shedding of blood, the resurrection of our Savior. And 50 days later is Pentecost. Jesus stepped out on the Mount of Olives and He rose up into heaven and 10 days later was Pentecost. That's why we're celebrating Pentecost starting Thursday. We're praying every day. We're seeking for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We're seeking for the business of the house of God. We're seeking for the work of God. We're seeking for His hand. And I'm asking everybody in the church, come to the church every day between now and Pentecost Sunday and spend a few minutes in prayer at the church. Brother Dunn, I can pray at home. What did Jesus say? Y'all just go back to your house till, day, till, till you receive power. No, he said you tarry at Jerusalem. Come and tarry for a few minutes in the house of God on your own time. Come bring your family and pray for a little while every day. God will bless you if you'll do it. Amen. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, they were all with one accord and one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. What were they supposed to do at Pentecost? In the Old Testament, they were told to go and do what? Rejoice. Why? Rejoice over the fact that they are not bound by death. Because the law gave them a pathway to life. Pentecost is a time of rejoicing. I'm going to tell you what. Them disciples weren't in the upper room being quiet. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray this world I can save from the sheep. Shikamoshai, pass me on by. Sell him a Honda, buy me a Kawasaki. See my tie, tie my tie. No, I'm going to tell you what they were doing. They were having a good time. Woo! I got the Holy Ghost. Hey, John, you got it? I got it like the Bible says. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. It's something like the power of the Holy Ghost. I can't explain it, but I got it. Oh, I got it. You can have it. You can have it. You can have it. Y'all, I'm starting to feel it. So if y'all going to join in with me, are we going to be in trouble here? It's real. It's real. I know it's real. There's something about the power of the Holy Ghost. Praise God, I know it's real. Oh, it's real. It's real. Amen. We are gathered here today to celebrate Pentecost. No. We are lively stones. Oh, I... I'm going to tell you what. Jesus says if they don't praise me, the stones will cry out. I'm going to tell you what. You don't need no stone. I'll rock and roll for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hello? Come on. I, I get excited when I think about what the Lord has done for me. He forgave me of my sins. He brought me out. I'm still excited about the Holy Ghost. 
Well, I'm a one God, apostolic tongue talking, holy roller, born again, heaven bound, believer in the liberated power of Jesus' name. I've been washed in the blood, sanctified by the Spirit. I believe in the holiness, and I suggest that you do the same. I've been washed, uh, saved, uh, whatever, forget it. Anyway, it's a good song. Where did that come from? When I was a little boy, I was sitting around the altar singing and shouting and running the aisles and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God touching me, watching miracles, signs and wonders and all kinds of great things. And God delivered me. I'll tell you what, there's some things that was laid in my heart when I was just a young child sitting on the pew. And I'll tell you what, though I ran from God, though I disobeyed God and all that, it all of a sudden, one of these days, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he will not depart. Don't give in to your kids and stay at home. Don't give in to your kids. I don't like, Mama, I don't like going to church. You don't like algebra either, but you make them learn it, don't you? Amen. Because one of these days it's going to be, oh, hey, Johnny, let's go over here and raid the liquor store. No, you know what? I, I Back in my old day and a little kid growing up, I, I, the Bible said, thou shalt not steal. Holy. Amen. You're giving them weapons to overcome. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, you gotta hide. if you don't hear the word, you can't hide the word. If you don't hide the word, you're going to fail. You have no... Why did they rejoice at Pentecost? Because that's when I got the word. God came down and wrote it in their tablets. And that was the word. But he said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do you something better than that. I'm going to take and write my word in your heart. Amen. I'm not just going to be a God on a mountain somewhere. I'm going to come down and I'm going to come be in you. He said, as He is in me, I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be a comforter. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. I'm going to, oh, let me tell you something. All of a sudden, my dead old body, I died to that flesh. I got kicked the devil out. I, I laid down in that water and I came up in Jesus' name. And now I want Him to fill me. I want Him to thrill me with His spirit. I want a Pentecost. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <coughs> and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Then the Word ascended on up into glory and said, I'm going to come again unto you. I will be in you. I'm going to tell you what, I got the Word inside of me. He's alive. I can hear Him. I can feel Him. I can... There's something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Amen. Boy, I wish I could sing. Got all the words, but I just don't have the melody. Amen? Amen? Let me tell you something. When you get the Holy Ghost, like Brother Piner said, I love you, Brother Piner, if you hear this. I, I, Brother Piner said, I got a little man inside of me. He's talking, telling me what to do. Amen. That's it. <laughs> Hello? That's what the Holy Ghost is. He'll give you peace. He'll give you joy. That's what Pentecost is all about. You see, 50 days from the time that Jesus was crucified, we had the day of Pentecost. And what was the day of Pentecost? It was a day of rejoicing. I in the those days saith the Lord, I shall pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters. Who was you supposed to bring to Pentecost celebration? Your sons and your daughters and your maidservants and your all the, the stranger and the Levi. Everybody was supposed to come to the Feast of Pentecost. Why? Because it wasn't for them alone. It wasn't just for mom and daddy. It wasn't just for the, well, the upper echelon of society. I am somebody. No. It was for the lowly maid servant. It was for the little stable boy. It was for everybody. Don't leave him at home. And the Bible says, and they begin to hear the word. And they begin to hear, what meaneth this? And Peter got up with the other apostles and said to them, these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. And they, you know, they don't sell alcohol in the middle of the night over there in Jerusalem. I know some people that are drunk before the first hour of the day. They only have one glass of wine a day. It just never goes empty. <laughs> I don't drink but one glass a day. Big glass. <laughs> Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And uh, there'll be uh, signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth below. All of these things are going to happen. The prophet Joel prophesied that. And here it is. It has come to pass. And David had said to my Lord, and saith unto my Lord, thy, uh, the heaven is thy throne and the earth is thy footstool. Have your way, Lord. And while he was preaching, the people began to what? Believe. Amen. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. 
And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said, Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, that's where we get that great scripture on the day of Pentecost. It was when the Pentecost celebration, there was people there from around the world that was commanded by the old law every year, three times a year, you journey to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Even, even Paul wanted to journey to Jerusalem for Pentecost. It was a celebration of life. It was a celebration of a new life. It was a celebration that I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer in bondage. I'm no longer dying. I'm no longer being executed. I'm no longer being persecuted. But I have life in the law. And I have life. And on the day of Pentecost, life fell on the 120 in the upper room. I'm going to tell you what, I don't mean to be unkind to some of these that are out there in these other religions that believe that Mary was some great thing. All she was was a vessel and a tool. She had to be in the upper room. And she had to get the same Holy Ghost that you can get. And she had to have it. Otherwise, she would be lost as well. And she was there in the upper room and she was one of the 120. And, and if Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, his wife had to have the Holy Ghost too because she was there. I don't know if she was married. I'm just... James, the brother of Jesus, had to have the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Your relationship to Jesus ain't going to get you to heaven. Your being a bride of Christ is going to get you to heaven. Being what Jesus wants. I, I, it dawned on me yesterday. Everybody, I want to be the friend of God. Can I tell you what? God's not coming back to find a friend. He's coming back to find a bride that has made herself ready. Amen. <laughs> we got to be ready. What is Pentecost? Pentecost is life. Pentecost is life. Say it with me. Pentecost is life. Pentecost is an example of life coming into our life. And when that day of Pentecost, and then after Peter said that, he also followed up Acts 2.39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I'm going to tell you who is God calling. He's calling whosoever will. Bring... Hello? Hello? Is Brother Graham there? I'm calling you. I'm calling you, Brother Robert. I'm calling you, Brother Farrell. I'm calling you, Brother Bob. I'm calling you, sis. I'm calling you, Sister Penny. Are you ready to answer? Whosoever will. God's calling today. God is calling out and sending a call to the entire city of Farmington. And I have sitting here in this church this morning the seeds of a mighty revival that can stretch all out onto the plains, out on the Bistai, and as far as you can imagine, on and on and on. There is no limitations to it. And I'm telling you this morning, God has you here, each and every one of you. You're not here by accident this morning. Nope. Amen. Because the call of God... Say, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to all men of every creature. Unto the Jew first and then unto the Greek and the Gentile. As far as you can go, spread the word. Tell them all about it. You've got to get this word out. Church family, the world is lost and dying. And if it doesn't find a Pentecost, they're going to die and go to hell. If this world doesn't find a Pentecost, they're going to be suffering a shameful death that they don't have to suffer. And while we're walking our road to glory, as we're on the stairway to heaven, as we're doing all that, and as we need to hang our head because our next door neighbor is on the highway to hell. He's waiting for somebody. He's waiting for a young man to say, I'm going to yield to the call of God and I want to preach the word. He's waiting on a young lady that says, I can be a testimony. I can be what God wants me to be because I want somebody else to have a Shabbat. I can want somebody else to have a Pentecost. I want somebody else to have life. Church family, God is calling us in this church to have revival. He's calling this church to Pentecost. He's calling this church to a great rejoicing celebration of Pentecost. I'm going to tell you what, there is not one of your snotty 
those kids that came to this altar and got the Holy Ghost that my soul didn't just boil over. And there's not one of you old folks that I, I'm picking on the Snyder's kids. I'm picking the old folks now. There's not one of your old folks that came down here and got the Holy Ghost that I didn't just get plum butterflies in my stomach over. Because when I see you praising God, when I see you repenting your sin, when I see the Holy Ghost fall on you, it's worth it all. Every mile that I've traveled, everything I've gone through, it's been worth it all. One child, one kid, oh, Junior, Jay got the Holy Ghost the other night. That was worth it all. Mamas and daddies, it'll be worth it all every time uh, you bring your kids to church. Every time you fight through the struggle of whether you want to be in church or not because you got a game on the, on the TV and you got a race or something. And you go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to go to church. I need to be in church. And your kid wants to go to a ball game or your kid wants to go jump on a trampoline or throw eggs at the neighbor's car. And you say, no, Johnny, we're going to go to church. Then that night he goes to the altar. <laughs> Forgive me, God. I remember the night Cassandra got the Holy Ghost. I was praying for Nolan Carpenter. I had Nolan on my knee and I had him up there and he was just about to get the Holy Ghost. And somebody came and tapped on my shoulder. It's Brother Tun, your daughter's getting the Holy Ghost. You need to go see it. And I, I, I've always, even today, I don't step on a pulpit, a platform anywhere unless I've been invited. But I climbed up on that platform and I leaned over the little bushes and my little girl standing there speaking in tongues. Oh, let me tell you something. What a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. What glory. You know something? It was worth it all. It was worth it all. And I'm going to tell you something, when your child makes the right decision and one of these days they come walking down the aisle with a, a godly husband, a godly wife, and she's kept herself under God and under her husband and he's kept himself under God and his wife and they come walking down that aisle and they stand before the preacher and the preacher prays over them and they're joined in holy matrimony and God has blessed their life. Oh, it's worth it all. And then that Sunday morning, when your child comes to church with your grandbaby, and they bring them up to that altar, they say, Preacher, I want to give my child unto God. I want to dedicate this child to God. It would be worth every hour. You'll have a Pentecost every hour. You'll have a Pentecost every moment. I'm going to tell you something. We're going to celebrate on June the 8th, the day of Pentecost. But let me tell you, you can have a Pentecost every day. For I know where Jesus brought me from. I know where God delivered me from. I know the wages of sin that I was bound in. And I know where God has given me grace. And I know God has given me mercy. And I can get up and shout every morning. Oh, hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord hath made. He is mercies are renewed daily. Blessed be the the name of the Lord God Almighty. He was, He is, and He is to come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because I've been to Pentecost. Why? Because I got a Pentecost. Why? Because I need the joy. I will rejoice. Amen. Pentecost is life. We celebrate life. You know the old the way I heard the joke as a kid growing up in the South. So this old rich man, he died. And he owned the bank. He owned the furniture store. He owned a few other dry good places. He owned everybody in town because they all owed him money. Got ready to die. He made up his mind. He said he had the seats taken out. And they put his casket inside his big old Cadillac. Man, it... Took care of the graveyard, the undertaker, a grave digger, whatever you want to call him, was a, was a colored gentleman, a black man, and his son would go to work with him. And that morning of the funeral, all these people showed up, and that little boy crawled out and he sat up on that little hill of dirt. And he was watching as they lowered that, that backhoe, lowered that, that, that Cadillac down in the hole in the ground. And the boy sitting up on the hill, he said, Man, that's living. No, that ain't living. Being lost and going to a devil's hell is not living. 
being free from sin, having the mercies of God, having all of your sins washed away. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's living. That's living. Let me look at my old man. That wasn't living. Egypt wasn't living. But I'm on my way to the promised land. And now I'm living. I got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. Just like the Bible said. Oh, hallelujah. Now I'm living. Now I'm truly living. I thought I was living when I was drinking. I wasn't living. I was sad. I was over. Anybody got a testimony with me? And you wasn't living on a bar stool. You were dying there. Anybody running with the world thought you were living until you got away from it and found out how free at last, free at last. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. I'll never forget whenever God healed me. I got so used to how bad I hurt every day, I didn't realize how bad I hurt. That's what sin will do to you. You will become so desensitized to the wages of sin and the, the sadness of your life that until you get free, you won't realize how bound you were. But that's where you've got to want it. You got to hunger for it. Jesus said you must be born again. You got to find a Pentecost. I want you to experience Pentecost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost in this house, I want you to receive the Holy Ghost. I want you to have a Pentecost. I want you to have an upper room experience just like the Bible says. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are afar off. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, I want you to be baptized in the name of Jesus because you can't get baptized any other way. You can't be saved without baptism in the name of Jesus. That's in the Bible. I can't help it. Brother Bob didn't write the Bible. Brother Graham didn't write the Bible. Ashley didn't write the Bible. Jesus said it. Amen. But you know what? He didn't say it to keep you out. He said it to get you in. The Bible's not a way out. It's a way in. Why would I deny the Word of God? Jesus said, for whosoever will. It's for you. It's for you. It's for your moms, your dads, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, your next door neighbors, the stranger. Sister Knowlton, the Bible tells us to bring the stranger to Pentecost. It's the last time you found somebody you don't know. God's got something for you. You're living in a life that is hard and God didn't design you to live that way. My friend, I've got an answer for you. I've got hope for you. I know you're going through struggles and trials and I know people have let you down. But I want to tell you about a man by the name of Jesus. I want to tell you about the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you about the power of salvation. Well, I've heard all that. Have you experienced life? You came and you got on your knees and you made a confession of faith and that's nothing wrong with that. But have you been born again of water and of spirit? I say this to you today, anybody under the sound of my voice. I encourage you to step out from the shadows of traditional religion and all the things that, of our mind that is not in according to the law of God and step out and allow the law of God truly to give you life. It's not hid from you. It's revealed openly before you. But in this week of Pentecost, as we celebrate, and every last one of you ought to be celebrating the blessings of God. You ought to be every day this week, make a special time that God has brought me. God has forgiven me. God has given me the Holy Ghost. God has been with me. God loves me. God died for me. And you need to have that fresh upon the front side of your mind so that your Pentecost is a time of rejoicing. And when you step in here to this church next Sunday morning, I believe God wants to fill a whole bunch of people with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you right now, I believe somebody would like, to, if you'd like the Holy Ghost right now, God could give it to you right this minute. If you don't have the Holy Ghost in here this morning, and I know our kids are coming in, that's okay, I don't care. If you don't have the Holy Ghost this morning, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. It's just as simple as this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on Calvary for you? Do you believe that God created you and doesn't want you to be lost? You must believe. Do you believe that Jesus shed His blood to cover your sins? I believe. Can you ask Him, Lord Jesus, will you forgive me of my sins and apply your blood to my heart? You can do that right now. If you don't have the Holy Ghost here this morning, 
and you're not ashamed of the Lord Jesus and you want to be saved and you want your own Pentecost. As the whole church stands right now, everybody stand. I don't want to single somebody out. But as everyone stands, I challenge you with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, no one moving around. But if you would like the Holy Ghost and you don't have it here this morning, would you raise your hand? I'm the only one looking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hands all over this house. Hands all over this house. Let's all stand and raise our hands right now. Father, Lord Jesus, you see these that have raised their hands this morning. Lord, I'm asking you to hear their hearts cry.